These men, going by with drunken faces and brains full of unawakened power, do not ask it of society or God. Their lives ask it. Their deaths ask it. There is no reply. Hey y'all, welcome back to Snark Notes. Today we're going to be taking a look at Life in the Iron Mills by Rebecca Harding Davis and the pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality, among other things. I hope you've got your uh, book nerd hats ready. This novella is pretty near and dear to my heart, actually. I read it for the first time in undergrad, and it really affected me. It helped me recontextualize the history of poverty and class in America, and how that legacy affects us today. Life in the Iron Mills is the story of an iron worker named Hugh Wolfe, and the impossibly wide gulf between him and the men who own the mill, between laborers and the rich who own their time and their bodies. Some background on Rebecca Harding Davis. She sounds cool as hell. Her father didn't want her to go to college, since she was a girl in the Victorian era in America, but she pushed back. Her parents ended up letting her attend seminary school, and she came out a blazing progressive, much to her father's chagrin. (laughs) Same. She fought for her writing career, bucking the traditional middle-class mold of being a homemaker. Life in the Iron Mills was her first published work, printed in 1861. It explicitly reflects her progressive beliefs about class, and, I would say, humanity at large, as it functions under industrial capitalism. She couched those beliefs, as well as her commitment to abolition and women's rights, in her Christianity, which isn't surprising, given her background in seminary. She definitely throws some shade at Protestant churches in this story, too. (laughs) It's great. If you haven't read this piece and you'd like to before listening to me fangirl all over it, Project Gutenberg has it in their database, and I'll leave a link to it in the description. All right, let's dive in. Okay, so first off, I want to just take a minute to appreciate Harding Davis's imagery. It's so vivid and haunting. Here's a chunk from the beginning of the novella. The idiosyncrasy of this town is smoke. It rolls sullenly in slow folds from the great chimneys of the iron foundries, and settles down in black, slimy pools on the muddy streets. Smoke on the wharves, smoke on the dingy boats, on the yellow river, clinging in a coating of greasy soot to the house-front, the two faded poplars, the faces of the passers-by, the long train of mules, dragging masses of pig-iron through the narrow street, have a foul vapour hanging to their reeking sides. Here inside is a little broken figure of an angel pointing upward from the mantel-shelf, but even its wings are covered with smoke, clotted and black. Smoke everywhere. A dirty canary chirps desolately in a cage beside me. Its dream of green fields and sunshine is a very old dream, almost worn out, I think. From the back window I can see a narrow brickyard sloping down to the riverside, strewed with rain-butts and tubs. The river, dull and tawny-coloured, La Belle Riviere, drags itself sluggishly along, tired of the heavy weight of boats and coal-barges. What wonder! When I was a child I used to fancy a look of weary, dumb appeal upon the face of the negro-like river, slavishly bearing its burden day after day. Something of the same idle notion comes to me to-day, when from the street-window I look on the slow stream of human life creeping past, night and morning, to the great mills. Masses of men, with dull, besotted faces bent to the ground, sharpened here and there by pain or cunning, skin and muscle and flesh begrimed with smoke and ashes, stooping all night over boiling cauldrons of metal, laired by day in dens of drunkenness and infamy breathing from infancy to death an air saturated with fog and grease and soot, vileness for soul and body. What do you make of a case like that, amateur psychologist? You call it an altogether serious thing to be alive. To these men it is a drunken jest, a joke, horrible to angels, perhaps, to them commonplace enough. My fancy about the river was an idle one. It is no type of such a life. What if it be stagnant and slimy here? It knows that beyond there waits for it odorous sunlight, quaint old gardens, dusky with soft green foliage of apple-trees, and flushing crimson with roses, air and fields and mountains. The future of the Welsh puddler passing just now is not so pleasant. To be stowed away, after his grimy work is done, 
in a hole in the muddy graveyard, and after that not air, nor green fields, nor curious roses. Harding Davis really captures the gritty reality of the workers in this town here, using the setting to convey their desolation. It's hard to imagine finding happiness in such a dull place like this one. Not even the canary has much hope. <laughs> and that's some good foreshadowing right there. You know, canary in a coal mine? Hmm? Literary symbolism is real, and your high school English teachers weren't crazy. You can't change my mind. <laughs> anyway, this passage also starts to raise questions about access to nature. The narrator describes a scene downriver, with the apple trees and the roses, where the landscape is fresh and rejuvenated, quite the contrast to this town. In doing so, she is underscoring how little hope the laborers have of ever finding that same kind of Eden, that same natural, calm life. Nature is inaccessible to these people because they are poor, and the rich couldn't care less if they have clean air or water, or a life worth living, because the rich see them, and require them to be, mere vessels for labor and profit. We'll be talking about that more later. After this scene setting, the narrator introduces us to Hugh, the Welsh puddler, and Deb, his cousin. Deb has been at work all day in a textile mill, and upon arriving home, she finds out that Hugh, who works the night shift, didn't take any food with him. Worried, she decides to take some to him. We get some more really stunning imagery from Harding Davis as she describes Deb walking across town to the mills. The road leading to the mills had been quarried from the solid rock, which rose abrupt and bare on one side of the cinder-covered road, while the river, sluggish and black, crept past on the other. The mills for rolling iron are simply immense tent-like roofs, covering acres of ground, open on every side. Beneath these roofs Deborah looked in on a city of fires that burned hot and fiercely in the night. Fire in every horrible form, pits of flame waving in the wind, liquid metal flames writhing in torturous streams through the sand, wide cauldrons filled with boiling fire, over which bent ghastly wretches stirring the strange brewing, and through all crowds of half-clad men, looking like revengeful ghosts in the red light, hurried, throwing masses of glittering fire. It was like a street in hell. Even Deborah muttered as she crept through, "'Looks like to devil's place.' It did, in more ways than one. If that doesn't drive home the despair the workers are forced into. So Deb finds Hugh and gives him the food, and he suggests that she stay and lie down on the ash heaps and get some rest, which she does. Amidst some exposition about Hugh, we find out that he makes sculptures out of coral. Not the seaweed coral, a different kind. Rebecca Harding Davis describes it as the refuse from the ore after the pig metal is run, a light, porous substance of a delicate, waxen, flesh-colored tinge. And that's another thing we'll get into later. As Hugh works, and Deb watches him, they notice some visitors come into the mill. The narrator tells us, He knew some of them, the overseer, Clark, a son of Kirby, one of the mill owners, and a Dr. May, one of the town physicians. The other two were strangers. Wolf came closer, he seized eagerly every chance that brought him into contact with this mysterious class that shone down on him perpetually with the glamour of another order of being. What made the difference between them? That was the mystery of his life. He had a vague notion that perhaps to-night he could find it out. We find out soon after that that the other two strangers are a photographer and Mitchell, Clark Kirby's brother-in-law. This interaction and the way it plays out is the crux of this story. These men waltz into the mills of their own volition. In fact, the narrator explains, the overseer, Kirby, was talking of net profits. The other gentleman had accompanied them merely for amusement. Amusement! That's a huge disparity, and it leaves us right there with Hugh wondering why he must spend his waking hours at the mill, while these visitors have the agency to decide if and when they want to be there at all. To make matters worse, as the visitors keep talking, they start to make fun of the idea of the workers collectivizing and advocating for better pay. Now, why should these men, who are all obviously well-off and could never know the sacrifices Hugh, Deb, and their fellow laborers make every day, be allowed to make decisions that dictate the lives of these workers? That question, my friend, is the first step toward class consciousness. So let's talk about the bootstraps mythology. I'm sure we're all familiar with the phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, particularly if you're an American, because that's the basis for that can-do attitude you need to obtain the American dream. Just work hard now until you strike it rich. 
It doesn't matter if you literally wear your body out. Climbing the ladder to property ownership is more important. <sighs> okay, <laughs> did you know that that phrase began as a joke? It's true. Anne Curzan, a linguist and English professor at the University of Michigan, says that it first appeared, as far as we know, in 1834, as a way of making fun of people who thought it was possible to transcend class boundaries. She likens it, as many people in the early 20th century did, to the idea of trying to get rich by taking money from one pocket and putting it into the other. But by the mid-1920s, the phrase transformed from an idiom into a mantra. Curzan states, What we clearly have lost is the idea that this actually defies the laws of physics, to pull yourself up using your own boots. Harding Davis's narrator never actually uses the phrase pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but that's certainly the attitude we get from the visitors. Kirby, the son of the mill owner, does say, The Lord will take care of his own, or else they can work out their own salvation. I have heard you call our American system a ladder which any man may scale. Do you doubt it? Transcending your working class position is totally possible, says this man who was born into wealth. Very credible. Very convincing. I'm so convinced. This quote also touches on a phenomenon in some Christian circles, too, particularly where prosperity gospel preachers and televangelists are concerned. The whole, it's in God's hands, so it's out of mine, attitude. Thinking that if you just pray about it and give your problems to God, then everything will turn out fine. No action required. And I'm not trying to bash prayer or faith here, because those things are well and good, especially when they're being used to actually help people in need. But if you are a rich pastor, let's say, and you're teaching people that there's no need to provide material relief to those who are suffering because God is somehow going to make their problems disappear? Well, it certainly meshes nicely with the bootstraps myth and the obsession with the Protestant work ethic. Kirby's rhetoric only gets worse from here. After seeing one of Hughes' sculptures, he and the doctor share this exchange. I tell you, there's something wrong that no talk of liberté or égalité will do away. If I had the making of men, these men who do the lowest part of the world's work should be machines, nothing more, hands. It would be kindness. God help them. What are taste, reason, to creatures who must live such lives as that? He pointed to Deborah, sleeping on the ash heap. So many nerves to sting them to pain. What if God had put your brain, with all its agony of touch, into your fingers, and bid you work and strike with that? You think you could govern the world better? laughed the doctor. I do not think at all. <laughs> that is true philosophy. Drift with the stream because you cannot dive deep enough to find bottom, eh? Exactly, rejoined Kirby. I do not think. I wash my hands of all social problems, slavery, caste, white or black. My duty to my operatives has a narrow limit, the pay hour on Saturday night. Outside of that, if they cut coral or cut each other's throats, the more popular amusement of the two, I am not responsible. The doctor sighed, a good, honest sigh from the depths of his stomach. God help us! Who is responsible? Not I, I tell you, said Kirby testily. What has the man who pays them money to do with their soul's concerns more than the grocer or butcher who takes it? Ah, oh, yes, a rich dude expressing his belief that poor people shouldn't have senses because that only compounds their suffering. How generous of him. Clearly, Kirby only sees these workers as a means to make money, as vessels for profit. I mean, he doesn't think they deserve to think and feel and create. His operators are work animals to him, perhaps less than that. So, of course, he thinks all he owes them is payment, rather than, say, decent working conditions or respect. And then this dude is so dense as to think he can just ignore any and all social problems. Which, like, of course he does. The issues of slavery or low-wage work will never affect someone like Kirby, because he's rich and he can avoid it. But because he is rich, he has more sway on the power structures that govern the country, and therefore could actually impact some kind of change. It would certainly be easier for Kirby to do that than for people like Hugh and Deb, who spend almost every waking moment working. But he won't, because he benefits from things staying the same. Now you may be thinking, okay, Snark, this dude's an asshat, but at least he's a fictional asshat. And I would raise you, Elon Musk, the man who won't let his workers unionize for better pay and working conditions. 
Or Jeff Bezos, whose company has just recently threatened to fire employees who speak out against its poor environmental policies and has forced other employees to pee in bottles rather than let them have, you know, bathroom breaks. Poor people don't need to pee. I love that for us, that despite how radically the world's modes of operation have changed since 1861, rich people's attitudes are at least a constant. Let's take a look at Dr. May next. He clearly holds the same faith in bootstrapping, but he expresses it differently than Kirby does. He is more affected by Hugh's coral sculptures, coral sculptures, <laughs> than Kirby is, too. Here's his interaction with Hugh. He went to Wolf and put a hand kindly on his arm. Something of a vague idea possessed the doctor's brain that much good was to be done here by a friendly word or two. A latent genius be warmed into life by a waited-for sunbeam. Here it was. He had brought it. So he went on complacently. "'Do you know, boy, you have it in you to be a great sculptor, a great man? Do you understand?' Talking down to the capacity of his hearer, it is a way people have with children and men like Wolf. "'Do you live a better, stronger life than I, or Mr. Kirby here? A man may make himself anything he chooses. God has given you stronger powers than many men, me, for instance.' May stopped, heated, glowing with his own magnanimity. And it was magnanimous. The puddler had drunk in every word, looking through the doctor's flurry and generous heat and self-approval into his will with those slow, absorbing eyes of his. "'Make yourself what you will. It is your right.' "'I know,' quietly. "'Will you help me?' Mitchell laughed again. The doctor turned now in a passion. "'You know, Mitchell, I have not the means. You know if I had, it is in my heart to take this boy and educate him for the glory of God and the glory of John May." May did not speak for a moment. Then, controlled, he said, "'Why should one be raised when myriads are left? I have not the money, boy,' to Wolfe shortly." Harding Davis doesn't mince words here. I love that she calls this character out for being condescending. And she recognizes how May's kindness is a ruse, a way to insulate himself from the guilt of seeing others in poverty. I'd love to help, I really wish I could, but I just don't have enough money. Also, it's really your responsibility, your right, your journey, to make something of yourself, he's saying. Dr. May doesn't care about Hugh and his destiny or whatever at all, because it would mean giving something up, some of his money, which he surely worked so hard to get. I think this attitude, this infantilization of the poor, is pretty common among middle and upper class people. I know I've been guilty of it. Like, shit, I grew up thinking that non-honors kids, who are often also from lower class backgrounds, weren't as smart. Oh, American public school. <laughs> but that's just not the case. In terms of this story, do you really think Kirby or May could successfully work Hugh's job? In reality, do you think Jeff Bezos could fly around like a banshee through the aisles of the warehouse and pick all the right items within the time constraints, as Amazon requires its employees to do? I doubt it. Our society believes the onus of financially bettering oneself lies on the poor, and so, if they can't lift themselves up, that must mean they're less competent. They're just failures. But in reality, it just means they're surrounded by people who would rather moralize and shame them than give them any material support. Mitchell's defense of the bootstraps myth plays out only slightly differently than Dr. May's. From the beginning of this scene, he seems to have more concern for these workers. Mitchell is softer in his attitude toward them. He understands Hugh's choral sculpture as a piece of art that asks questions of God, that functions as essentially a class critique when his friends do not. And when Kirby and May scoff and wash their hands at the notion of poverty, Mitchell kind of rips into them. He seems to be skeptical about the idea of being rich. But then, at the end of the scene, we get a look at the real Mitchell. The doctor kicks off this interaction. Go back, Mitchell. You say the pocket in the heart of the world speak without meaning to these people. What has its head to say? Taste? Culture? Refinement? Go. Mitchell was leaning against a brick wall. He turned his head indolently and looked into the mills. There hung about the place a thick, unclean odor— the slightest motion of his hand marked that he perceived it, and his insufferable disgust. That was all. May said nothing, only quickened his angry tramp. "'Besides,' added Mitchell, giving a corollary to his answer, "'it would be of no use. I am not one of them.' 
"'You do not mean,' said May, facing him. "'Yes, I mean just that. Reform is born of need, not pity. No vital movement of the peoples has worked down for good or evil, fermented instead carried up the heaving, cloggy mass. Think back through history and you will know it. What will this lowest deep, thieves, magdalens, negroes, do with the light filtered through ponderous church creeds, Baconian theories, Goethe schemes? Some day, out of their bitter need, will be thrown up their own light-bringer, their Jean-Paul, their Cromwell, their Messiah. God, what a letdown! Mitchell shows himself to be no better than Dr. May, putting on this face of solidarity and empathy. But, as he shows here, when push comes to shove, he is not an ally to the working class. He comports himself as much. When he leaves, he looks at Hugh and touches his hat as to an equal but maintains that his higher class position bars him from effective advocation of workers' rights. Mitchell is twisting Marx's theory of class revolt, that workers will become so oppressed by poor labor conditions that they unite and overthrow the capitalist class. And that essentially allows him to justify his own position in the capitalist hierarchy. And that's a shame, because if any of these men were going to be sympathetic, both to the working class characters and to us as readers, it was Mitchell. So, with this scene, Harding Davis has shown us three variations of how the higher classes treat the poor and working class. But the end result of each is the same. The poor are denied their humanity. That's a thread that runs throughout this story. I mean, we saw it in the introduction. The people in the town are forced to live in poor conditions, their air and water are not clean, and their lives are a joke because they have no time to do anything but work. Here's an excerpt about Deb that I think really illustrates this theme. Miserable enough she looked, lying there on the ashes like a limp, dirty rag, yet not an unfitting figure to crown the scene of hopeless discomfort and veiled crime, more fitting, if one looked deeper into the heart of things, at her thwarted woman's form, her colourless life, her waking stupor that smothered pain and hunger, even more fit to be a type of her class. Deeper yet, if one could look, was there nothing worth reading in this wet, faded thing, half covered with ashes? No story of a soul filled with groping, passionate love, heroic unselfishness, fierce jealousy? Of years of weary trying to please the one human being whom she loved, to gain one look of real heart-kindness from him? Deb, Hugh, and all these other workers are human beings, with thoughts, feelings, and dreams. That's what we're supposed to take away from Hugh's sculptures, too. It makes the musings of men like Kirby, who think that workers would be better off without brains and nerves, and like Dr. May, who superficially praises Hugh's artistic talent, all the more concerning. These rich characters, and the real people that they represent, cannot let themselves see the humanity in their workers, or else it would force them to reconsider how they treat them. It would force them to see that subjecting another human to the brutal conditions of the factories, or, today, low-wage jobs in the gig economy, is exploitative and wrong. It's kind of ironic to me that it takes one of Hugh's choral sculptures to prompt the visitors to have any reflection about this issue. Because, you know, it's a sculpture, not a living, breathing human. Let's take a look at that, shall we? There was not one line of beauty or grace in it, a nude woman's form, muscular, grown coarse with labor, the powerful limbs instinct with some one poignant longing. One idea, there it was in the tense, rigid muscles, the clutching hands, the wild, eager face, like that of a starving wolf's. Kirby and Dr. May walked round it, critical, curious. Mitchell stood aloof, silent. The figure touched him strangely. In the dialogue that follows, we see that Dr. May clearly doesn't get it. First, he's surprised that Hugh could have such an accurate conception of the human form. Come on, my guy. Even Kirby understands that Hugh is working with all these other bodies in the mill, and that's perfect for him to study anatomy. <laughs> Second, May can't for the life of him figure out what it means. So Mitchell's like, I don't know, man, maybe ask the artist. And May does. But what did you mean by it? She be hungry. Wolf's eyes answered Mitchell, not the doctor. Oh, but what a mistake you've made, my fine fellow. You have given no sign of starvation to the body. It is strong, terribly strong. It has the mad, half-despairing gesture of drowning." Wolfe stammered, glanced appealingly at Mitchell, 
who saw the soul of the thing he knew. But the cool, probing eyes were turned on himself now, mocking, cruel, relentless. "'Not hungry for meat?' the furnace tender said at last. "'What, then? whisky? jeered Kirby with a coarse laugh. Wolfe was silent a moment, thinking. "'I don't know,' he said, with a bewildered look. "'It may be. So mat to make her live, I think, like you. Whisky'll do it, in a way.' The young man laughed again. Mitchell flashed a look of disgust somewhere, not at Wolfe. "'May,' he broke out impatiently, "'are you blind? Look at that woman's face. It asks questions of God and says, I have a right to know. Good God, how hungry it is!' "'Oh, my God, Kirby and May kill me. Well, clearly she's fed and strong. What's wrong with her? She's got no one to live, you dense assholes, because people like you make things miserable for the working class.' But happiness and contentment with life is a kind of privilege, I guess. And listen, you can tell me all you want that money doesn't buy happiness, but come on, it makes it a gazillion times easier to be happy when you have clean water and a comfy bed and access to medicine and, like, free time. Honestly, I think that having time and resources to create art makes it easier to be happy as well. I know my depression is at its worst when work has sapped my energy and creative drive. Maybe a lot of y'all have found yourselves in a similar boat. Hugh certainly has a need to make art. That leads me to one of the things that really stuck out reading this story again post-graduation versus an undergrad, the dynamic between art and class. So yeah, Hugh needs to make art to process his feelings and experiences. He uses the choral sculptures as a means to express his frustration at being poor, despite working hard his whole life. Let's think back to how Mitchell describes Hugh's sculpture. Look at that woman's face. It asks questions of God and says, I have a right to know. The narrator tells us a few times that the mystery of Hugh's life is what makes him different, lesser than these rich men. He is using his sculpture, then, to try to figure out what makes laborers like him less human and less privy to the ability to enjoy life. <laughs> and I'm not just reading into this too deeply, I promise. The narrator tells us, in a later scene in which he is observing upper-class churchgoers, that Hugh is wondering, was it not his right to live as they, a pure life, a good, true-hearted life, full of beauty and kind words? He only wanted to know how to use the strength within him. That strength is his artist's eye. This man just wants to make art, y'all. He wants to be able to look out at the world for all its beauty and wonder, and translate that for others. But he can't because he's stuck in an exhausting, dehumanizing job that makes it nearly impossible for him to even afford food. And the other workers in the mill make fun of Hugh for his sculptures, even though, the narrator explains, they can see the beauty in them. But it's not these workers' fault for being so skeptical of art. The mill discourages creativity and any attempt to break the status quo. To do otherwise would affect profits because it wouldn't incentivize the workers to work hard enough or it would give the workers just enough room to consider themselves as more than machines. Oh golly, think of the consequences of workers realizing their humanity. They might collectivize and go on strike or something. But you can't question power structures when you're too busy with your nose to the grindstone, hating all your coworkers who don't get enough done. So yeah, I think one of the things we're meant to take away from this story is the idea that art is a fundamental expression of humanity. But people of lower class backgrounds are denied a right to create, which is simultaneously a function of the belief that poor people are worth less and a method to ensure poor people remain divorced from that humanity. We see this play out in Dr. May's interaction with Hugh. May, remember, is taken aback by the quality, the sheer anatomic detail, of Hugh's choral woman, and he makes it a big deal to praise Hugh's ability, assuring him that he can become anything he wants. But gosh, when Hugh asks for some help so he can realize his dream as an artist, May somehow loses all that goodwill he was so proud to show off up to this point. Not only is that an expression of discouragement for Hugh's artistic pursuits, but it's a reminder to him of who's in control, and it sends him reeling. After this scene, Hugh asks, What am I worth, Deb? Is it my fault that I am no better? My fault? Tell me that's not heartbreaking, please. This man just wants to make shit, but he can't, because in a capitalist society, art is often reserved only for people who go into it with steady financial resources. Because capitalism makes art about profit. 
not finding genuine enjoyment, not having the time and space to explore yourself and your craft. I'm not cynical. Am I sounding cynical? Because I promise I'm totally not cynical. I think Harding Davis does a really good job of humanizing Hugh and Deb and showing just how hard their society is failing them. How impossible it is for them to be anything they choose or pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Those things are completely out of the question for them because they do not have access to the opportunities Kirby, May, and Mitchell had. That is, primarily, being born into wealth. Harding Davis makes it clear, too, that rich people are not going to save anybody but themselves, so middle-class folks absolutely must start cultivating class consciousness and solidarity with poor and working-class folks. Humans are not supposed to live in a constant state of exhaustion and anxiety about where our next meal will come from, or whether our child will live because we don't have access to proper medicine. Everyone should have a right to enjoy their lives and be happy and healthy. And everyone deserves the right to express themselves, whether that's through art or some other activity. We're not just bodies to exploit. I hope you found this story as compelling as I did. Or, if you haven't read it, I hope my take has been exciting at least. I will say, Deb is a total based comrade babe. She steals money from one of the men, and it's cathartic as hell for a second. But it ultimately sucks because capitalism sucks and it demonizes poor people, yay! So, in closing, go make some art. Do it for yourself and your own pleasure. Make it an anti-capitalist gesture. Shit, make the whole thing anti-capitalist if you like. Take some pleasure in something little today. Something that makes you happy. Maybe something that you don't have to buy. Cultivate empathy for others. And always remember that the bootstraps myth is a lie. A horrible joke that needs to end. Thank y'all so much for watching. As always, I super appreciate it. If you liked this one, go just just go click that like button. It takes like half a second. And like the subscribe button's just right there, so you could click that too if you wanted. And then the comment box isn't that far away, so maybe go put something there. <laughs> See y'all next time.